Daniel chapter number 3. I'm going to read one verse, verse number 19. The Bible says, Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Now, we don't have time to read the whole chapter. We're not, we, we aren't going to pull a Brother Doug introduction today. One of Brother Thad's introductions. Right? But you go study it out. At the end of chapter number 2, Daniel found favor in the eyes of King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar gave him many gifts. Daniel wasn't impressed with any of them. He said, you know, he wanted to make him head over all of Babylon and everything. He said, now I'll sit in the king's gate. That's the position that Daniel desired. And then you find that he mentions to the king, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And because of the favor that Daniel had, those three fellows were put in charge of all of Babylon. Okay, go study it out. So then, chapter number 3 comes around, and Nebuchadnezzar makes an image which he claims is a god, but it looks a whole lot like him. That must have just been a coincidence, Brother Ron. Yeah. And uh, he thinks it's the most glorious thing that's ever been made. So he gets everybody and their sister together to play all the instruments, go read about all the different... They had everything, you know, they had, the, they had something close to a bagpipe, Okay. That's what the sack butt was. So if you've got something close to a bagpipe, you've pretty much exhausted all of the other instruments to get to bagpipe. Right? He's got the whole band there. Okay? And then anybody that the band knows that also might be able to play music to this beautiful statue that he made. Okay? And he makes the decree when all the trumpets and all the psalteries and the sack butts and the organs and everything else that he had there Right, start playing that everybody that was assembled there that day was supposed to fall down before it and worship the image. Yeah, but there's just one problem with that. Now, name of Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. You say, who is that? Well, those were the Hebrew boys that were taken into captivity that when they were taken into captivity, the Babylonians renamed them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, the reason they did that, changed their names. You know, Daniel was known as Belteshazzar after he was taken into captivity. The reason they did that was to separate them from the life that they used to have and to rename them with a Babylonian name so that they would forget their former selves and they would embrace their new life. Okay? Well, the problem with that was Daniel and Hananiah and Azariah and Mishael, they didn't forget the way that they was raised. In fact, you find when they were taken, they were noted in chapter number 1, as being very wise men. God had blessed them with intellect. And so Nebuchadnezzar, he said, go find them all out of the land of the Jews. Anybody that could be, you know, you studied that, anybody that could be a mason, anybody that could be an architect, anybody that could be an engineer, anybody that knew anything about spirituality, he says, go find them and make them a part of my wise men. So that's what they did. Now, these fellows just weren't, you know, they, off they found favor in the eyes of the Babylonians because, one, they had favor with God, and they had favor with God because they were faithful to God and loyal to God. But they also found favor because they had a use for them. Okay, I mean, just like Joseph, you know, he was sold into slavery. Right? Well, when he was sold into slavery, he found favor in the eyes of Potiphar until Potiphar didn't have a use for him anymore. It didn't matter how blessed Joseph was with gifts from God. When Potiphar thought that Joseph had cheated on his wife, or cheated with his wife against Potiphar, committed adultery, right then it didn't matter how loyal Joseph was, he was done with him. Put him in prison. It was all a lie. But he still changed his opinion. Okay, so here we got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. go. Music starts playing, and they just keep standing. And then you're going to find a group of people called the Chaldeans. Okay? They notice that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they aren't bound down and worshiping the idol like they're supposed to. Everything would have been fine except for the Chaldeans. Okay? Nebuchadnezzar never would have known about it. Well, why were the Chaldeans watching those three fellas? Because go back to chapter number two. 
And the Chaldeans were the group of people that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream and forgot it, but it troubled him in his soul. And he told all the soothsayers and the magicians and everybody else, they were the group called the Chaldeans. And he said, y'all need to tell me what my dream was and what the meaning of it was because I've got a feeling it's pretty important. And they said, how in the world are we going to tell you what you dreamed? Like, if you remembered it, we might be able to, you know, do something with it. Right? But you forgot it. How are we supposed to remember something we don't know? Right? Well, then Nebuchadnezzar goes and he threatens to kill all the Chaldeans if they can't give him the answer. Right? Well, eventually somebody remember. hey, Daniel might know something about that. So Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they met and had a prayer meeting, and then God revealed to Daniel what the dream was and the meaning thereof was. So Daniel went and told Nebuchadnezzar, and then because of that, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, now they're the bigwigs. Chaldeans were jealous because they didn't think that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego deserved to be there. Okay, that ring true to anybody else, but just turn a couple of pages and you're going to find out there was a whole big mess of people that didn't like Daniel. Why? Because he had been promoted and found favor. So they were looking for any reason to turn them into the king. Right, well, same thing happened here. Chaldeans are looking around and they're saying, hey, them boys that have jobs bigger than us now because we were failures, uh, they're not doing what the king said. So they went and told the king. And the king, granted, these are the fellows that just helped reveal unto him the dream that he had not too long ago. They've got favor in his eyes. I'm sure that as, you know, once they were promoted, they was doing a great job. Nebuchadnezzar says, hey boys, I'm sure that you guys just didn't hear. There's a lot of people here today. You might have been real far away. But uh, when all this stuff happens, you're supposed to bow down and worship that statue, and I'm going to give you one more chance. And they said, in no less terms, uh, no thank you. And we're not careful to answer the king. You can threaten to kill us. You can threaten to do this. You can threaten to do that. But we know who the real God is, and we're not bowing down to something that isn't God. And then we get to verse number 19. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was not just hot. He was very hot. Yeah, very angry. So angry, in fact, that Nebuchadnezzar, who before said that he was going to throw him in the fiery furnace, now says that fiery furnace is going to be heated up seven times hotter than it's ever been. Not seven times hotter than they normally run it. Notice, he says, seven times hotter than it was want to be heated. Well, how hot do you want to heat something to? To a safe level. Right? You don't turn your oven on up to 3,000 degrees, right? Because it's not made to run that. Okay? What do you heat your oven up to? What you want it to be heated to? What it's made to operate at? Right? So he's saying not just seven times hotter than we normally use it, seven times hotter than it's ever been. Because at one point they tested it, I'm sure, and they're like, well, how hot can this thing go? I don't know, just crank it up. And then once they did that, they're like, well, if it can handle that, it can handle any of the other stuff we normally do. Right? That's called proofing things. That's how they used to do canons, too. They'd stuff a whole bunch of gunpowder down in it, and if it didn't explode when they lit it, all right, you can use it. That's how they did it. What were they doing? They were stress testing it. Well, I'm sure they did the same thing with the furnace. Okay, now, seven times hotter than the furnace has ever been. Then we know the story. They go through. This is how, this is how angry Nebuchadnezzar was. He had the strongest guys in his army lay hold on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then throw them into the furnace, knowing that they's probably going to die too. He was so angry, he didn't care that he just killed his best soldiers trying to throw these guys into a furnace. That's how angry he was. Well, why was he angry? Because his pride was hurt because the statue looked like him. But that's a different story. Okay, I want to talk about this furnace. This furnace, from everything that I've read, and I can't tell you that it is true, but I can understand that it's very likely, was one of two types of furnaces. The first would have been an iron smelting furnace. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar, reigned about 600 B.C. to about 550 B.C. That's the tail end of the Iron Age. Okay, They knew how to work with iron. The thing about iron is you have to heat it a whole lot hotter than copper and zinc was, which is why they used bronze before that. 
And you have to get it hot and you have to keep it hot so that the iron can melt out from the rock and all the ore and everything else it was attached to. And once it gets melted down, then you can separate it and you can forge it into weapons. Then if you quench that iron, they used to call that wrought iron, if you quench the wrought iron in either oil or water after you get done forging it into whatever you want, it turns the outer edge of it into steel. Okay, that was the big innovation. Well, see, Babylon, very big nation, didn't just happen because people decided to shake hands one day and say, let's make a new kingdom. No, they were fighters. They knew about iron. They knew about tools that you could work in the field that were made out of iron. Right? Why? Because they were stronger than bronze. And if you have an iron sword and you're going up against somebody who has a copper sword, iron sword can cut copper sword in half. Okay? Second type of forge that this thing, or furnace that this thing could have been, could have been a brick furnace. Okay, Babylon was known for the very ornate masonry. They would take not just bricks, they would glaze bricks with different colors and different patterns, and then they'd put them in a furnace and dry the bricks out, and then they'd come out and they'd be ruby colored or emerald colored or whatever design it was. And they were known for their architecture and making things not just sturdy, but pretty too. Okay? But I went and I started looking at different things. In order to heat a brick, not just a regular brick, we're not talking about like bricks on brick houses. Okay, we're talking about high quality, what we would call fire bricks nowadays. But they're bricks that you can basically hit with a nuke and nothing's going to happen. Right? You can build fire pits out of them. You can build houses out of them if you want to. Right? But they are known for being able to get very hot for a very long time and nothing happened to them. Okay? Those fire bricks, you have to fire them at 400 degrees Celsius. Well, what's that in Fahrenheit? I don't know. I didn't do the conversion. Numbers were easier to remember in Celsius. 400 degrees Celsius. Well, what's that? That's four times the boiling point of water. Okay? That's just to dry them out. But if you want to make them really resilient, you go up to about 700 degrees Celsius. Okay, now to put that into perspective, if this was a furnace made for forging iron, okay, or any other precious metal at the time, gold's the only one that you don't have to put through a refining forge because it comes out of the ground, just gold. Okay, but iron, copper, silver, all those others, you've got to smelt them down, that's the process, to separate rock from silver. Okay, or iron or copper, whatever it is. That furnace has to get up to at least 1,700 degrees Celsius because the melting point of iron is about 1660 in Celsius. You say, well, how hot is all these numbers that you're talking about? Well, keep in mind, that's normal operating temperature. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt and think this is a big industrial brick kiln. Because everybody knew the fiery furnace. Okay, a normal Every blacksmith back in the day had a furnace that could melt iron in their shop. All you needed was charcoal and then a big bellows thing to make it pump air to get it hot. But there's only about this big around. You can't throw four dudes into a forge this big around. It's not going to happen. Right, let's say it's a big industrial brick forge. Okay, you, they take them fire bricks and they line the whole thing with it. Then they take the unfinished brick, they lay them into the bottom, cover them all up with charcoal, start to fire, and let them bake for a while. Right, let's say it's one of those. Let's say it's one that's big enough that you could throw four dudes into. Well, three dudes into, and then have enough room for Jesus in there too. Okay, But... You've got a forge that big. Because everybody knew about the, the fiery furnace. Okay? They didn't have furnaces that heated homes back in that day. That didn't become popular until the tail end of the Roman age. Okay, these forges, they were used to make something. It wasn't something that Nebuchadnezzar just dreamed up and said, I want my own forge to kill people in. No, this was a furnace that served a purpose. But because he was so angry, he said, I want these people to suffer. We're going to throw them in fire. Not going to hang them, not going to chop their heads off. If you don't bow down and worship the thing that I want you to worship, you're going to die a horrible death. Yeah, well, how hot would seven times 400 degrees Celsius be? 
Well, rocks start melting at 2,000 degrees Celsius. Okay, talking rocks that you get up out the ground. They turn into magma, the stuff that comes out of volcanoes. Okay, that's, that's pretty hot. But 7 times 400 would be 2,800 degrees. At 2,800 degrees, those fire bricks that we talked about, they'd start glowing like hot metal. It'd be so hot to even get to the outside of the furnace that anything that would touch the walls of the furnace, dead. Okay, we're talking so hot that if you touched it with a hand, you wouldn't realize your hand was gone by the time you looked at it. But just vaporized. Okay, we're talking about literally as hot as engines that send things to space. Okay, and the fire coming out of spaceships. You say, well, that's not that hot. Why do you think they clear out about 18 miles away from that thing before it launches? But even the exhaust from that thing could cook you alive. But we've got this big... Well, how do they make something that big, that hot? Well, this is how angry Nebuchadnezzar was. He said, get everybody and everybody that they know down to the furnace. Because this thing ran off of wood, charcoal. Anybody know the big old steam engines and the boilers? Right, they always got that one guy in all the movies or all the cartoons that's shoveling coal into the burner. Right, why'd they have to keep doing that? Because coal ran out. But they still needed engine to stay hot so that the water boiled. Right, well, what do you think happens to charcoal? It burns up. What do you think happens to wood? It burns up. He's got a whole army feeding wood into this thing to get it hot enough that it, the bricks on the outside of it start glowing. Right? He's got people working air bellows to pump oxygen into the bottom of this thing so that that's how you make a fire hotter, if you all didn't know, by the way. Get you like a, a metal tube, a leaf blower, and a campfire and stick the metal tube in the bottom of the fire, turn the leaf blower on on the other side, big fire. Okay, that's just science. Because what does wood need to burn? Heat and oxygen. But what happens when oxygen burns up inside of your fireplace? It has to suck new air into the fireplace to get more oxygen. Well, they're forcing more air in. Right, they got guys working giant bellows, right, like huge accordion things, pumping new fresh air into the bottom of this thing. And the whole time, literally, rocks bricks, everything around it starting to melt. That's how hot this furnace has gotten. Okay? And then, I want you to think, we don't know where Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, where this statue was built, but I doubt that Nebuchadnezzar built his prized possession, an image of himself, next to a big fiery furnace. That's not pretty to look at. Chances are they were on you know different parts of town. So he sends the order, and they start pumping that thing, waiting for him to get there. They're thinking, we got to get everybody that we can get enough arm power to get the air pushing through this furnace. we got to throw more wood in than we've ever thrown in before. And as it keeps getting hotter and hotter, guys keep passing out, sweating, trying to work these bellows and throw this wood in. And they're thinking, there's no way we can. And all the time, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are walking, through, and there's just pillars of smoke up on the other side of the city and they're walking towards it. Now they've already told Nebuchadnezzar, our God is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace. But if one of them, you know, might have been like Peter or one of us and been a little smart aleck, like nudged one of the other ones and was like, well, I know that God could have delivered us from it when it was like at regular heat, but what about that? Right, I ain't never seen that much smoke coming out of it. It's a silly thought to have. Because you don't understand all the times before this that these boys stake their life on their faith. I know that they weren't doubting it, but the whole time they're looking at this big column of smoke. Do you guys ever see those reactors or some of the smoke plumes down on the river? And you can see the smoke for miles. And they're seeing all that smoke go up into there and they just got to keep walking through it. Now I'll be honest. Verses here don't say nothing about smoke. But it does say, at the end of the chapter, that when they came out of the fire, that they didn't even smell like the fire. Well, what's fire smell like? Smoke. So there was smoke. 
And then, getting ready for the Phillips family to be here this weekend, I was listening to all the albums I got in my iTunes, and one of their songs, which I'll argue may be one of my favorite, that's like splitting hairs though, on which one of my favorite songs of the Phillips family. But one of them is When the Smoke Clears. First verse is about these boys. I was sitting there and I was thinking, I never thought about the smoke before. I'd heard that song dozens of times, never stopped to think. I'm like, there had to have been a whole lot of smoke. But, well, but the Lord's help we're going to teach on this morning, going into the smoke. Okay, this furnace, it had to have access to the top, right, to air, to vent all the smoke. But this thing's pumping out at seven times hotter than it should. This thing's melting bricks on the side of it as they're churning this thing, trying to keep it hot. Get it hotter than it's ever been. Not just a little bit, seven times hotter than it's ever been. And the thing is melting itself apart. There's going to be holes in the bricks start to form. What's coming out the side? Smoke. The room that used to had no smoke in it, now it's got a whole lot of smoke pouring into it. And the more air you pump in, the more fire and the more smoke you're getting out. And they're pumping this thing as hard as they can. Just to give you all an idea. Okay? A train, that big thing on the front of the lead car, the train engine, that big round thing is filled up with water. The fire that they use to make that thing hot and to boil that water, very, very small. Everybody thinks, oh, that big thing in the front is just one big fire. No. That's filled with water to make steam. But even the little fire on that train, you see it start going down the tracks, that big tube on the front of the train engine, that was to let smoke out. That's not steam. Steam goes into the train, make train go. Smoke bad, smoke go out. Right? We all can agree on that. But just that train, with that little tiny fire thing that's making all this water boil. And you see that train go down the tracks. Look at how much smoke that puts out. Now imagine a furnace that's big enough for three guys to be thrown into. Big enough that when it got hot enough, right, the guys that threw those three guys into the furnace died instantly. Right, imagine how much smoke that thing's putting out. Trains burn coal, which make less smoke than wood. And they're making this thing run off of charcoal and any fabric, whatever they can get to make this thing burn a little bit hotter. Right? They're throwing oil and everything else in there trying to make this thing just get... King said hot, let's make it hot. So imagine all the smoke. But what's the smoke represent? First thing, smoke represents obscurity. Smoke keeps you from seeing what's on the other side of the smoke. Now notice, they said God was able to deliver them from the fiery furnace. They still had to get from where they were through the smoke to get to the fire. Smoke filled up that room that they was in. I imagine that it wasn't a furnace like nowadays where it had a door to it. right? I'm sure there was a way that they could have got down into it. right? Maybe there was steps at some point or something else. But this thing was big and it was made to put things into and to get hot. You don't have a door on the side of that thing. But they're sitting there. we got to get from where we are. through the They can't see the furnace. They don't know what they're getting ready to be thrown into. They know it's going to be hot. They know that if God doesn't do something, they're going to die. But they also know that God's able. So that means it's all up to God what happens to us. But they still got to get through the smoke. I don't know if you're like me. But I hate things that I can't wrap my head around. Right? I don't need to figure it out. I just need to know what it is. Right? At least let me know what's getting ready to happen. Right? As you know, a lot of times they say people's heart rate and everything else spikes when they go into surgery or when they're having medical procedures done. Why? It's because they don't know what's getting ready to happen. They've had a doctor explain it to them, but they can't wrap. No, I want to know what's about ready to happen to me. Well, go get a medical degree, and then you can figure it out. Right? That's why the doctor's the one that's doing it, not you. Right, but seriously, anything in our lives. If we can't figure it out what to do, it terrifies us. Right, sometimes it confuses us. 
Right? Confusion in itself isn't a bad thing until you let your confusion keep you from moving forward. Here's the bottom line of it. Is God's will for them to go into the fire? Well, how do you know? Because God let it happen. If it wasn't God's will, it wouldn't have happened. So God permitted it to happen. Which means God allowed it. So it's God's will for them to go into the fire. What's the fire's purpose? Well, we've already talked about it. This fire was made to refine things, to take that which was precious and separate it from those things that aren't precious. Okay, fire was made to harden things, to make them more durable. But, well, what are those? We don't like going in. We, we think we're going through a fire most of the time. Right? It's nothing compared to what those before us had to go through. But we think, oh, it's going to get hot. I don't want it to get hot. Well, the purpose of the fire, it's God's will for you to be in the fire, not in the smoke. Right? You've got to get into where it's hot. Why? Because that's where something's going to happen. Well, the smoke keeps you from seeing what's happening in the fire. Well, I don't know what I'm, you know, what's going to be melted off and what I'm going to get to keep. Let me, let me you know, just let you in on a little secret. The things that are going to melt off are the things that God don't want in your life, and the things that you're going to keep are the things that God wants you to keep in your life. But that's all that we need to know. Well, I don't know what's going to happen. Well, you're going to be hardened. Right? Didn't the Apostle Paul write to fortify your members? What's that mean? He's not talking about your arms and your legs and your fingers. Okay? He's talking about your faith, your will, your determination, your motivation to continue living for God. How are those things strengthened? You've got to put them to the test. A brick that hadn't been fired is worthless. You know why? Because it's got too much water in it. Too much water makes it clay. Now clay's not as easy to move around as dirt or Play-Doh, but you can make clay move. You can shape it into things. But once that water comes out of it, it becomes hard as a rock. And not just hard as a clay brick that's been made a certain way can stay around a whole lot longer than rock will. That's why that furnace was made to, if it was an iron forge, it was made to melt rocks and melt metal. So they made it out of fire bricks that were strong enough to resist the heat. Right? Which is why when the bricks start melting, you know, oh, we're in trouble. Why? Because the bricks are the things that are supposed to keep the fire in and not out. And those things are melting away because it's seven times hotter than it's ever been before. And all this smokes, in, and the closer you get, you can feel the heat, but you don't know what's causing it. Well, how big is the fire? Fire is fire. Hot is hot. Right? You can either, yes, Lord, submit to it, go into it expecting, Lord, I know it's going to be, I don't like it hot. Everybody knows this. Okay, if it was my will, that thermostat over there be set to 50 year round. Because y'all can put more clothes on, I can't start taking a suit off while I'm up here teaching Sunday school. Okay? But, I like it cold. But if I know I'm going to be hot, guess what I do? I prepare for it. Right? I'm taking water with it. I don't drink water ever. If you see me with water, it's because I'm going somewhere that's probably Death Valley. Okay? Or where these folks came from in Arizona, out in the desert. Right? I'm going somewhere where I know it's hot. Right? Chances are, okay, especially after our last outing, they told me it was going to be 30 minutes on a kayak and it ended up being four hours. Okay? <laughs> they said, well, it was supposed to be an hour. I'm like, it still took four hours. I didn't take enough sunscreen for four hours. Okay? In fact, I didn't take... I'm not going to need any more of it. We're only going to be out there for a little bit. It's going to last that long. It did not last that long. Christian put a photo in the Goofy Family album from the cruise trip where literally I'm wearing a white shirt and then the rest of me is lobster. <laughs> right? And it's bad. Like I couldn't... It, like it was one of them where you lay down and you hurt. Right? Everything from here up was fine, but I mean, arms, legs, face, I was on fire. 
Right? But if I was going into, let's say, to fight a forest fire, I'm taking the right equipment. I'm not going in in shorts and a t-shirt. Right? Firemen have fire suits. Why? Because they don't burn. Okay, they've even got ones that have like reflective metal material on the outside of it that even when regular stuff would start to burn, it's not going to melt. You say, well, Brother Jordan, they didn't have to wear any of that in there. Yeah, but God also said put on the whole armor of God. We're not talking physically, we're talking spiritually. You know it's going to get hot. Why in the world wouldn't you put on the armor that's made to go into hot things? Didn't God promise that it would withstand all the wiles of the devil? You say, well, this, God didn't intend for this furnace to be built. Well, God didn't intend for Job right, to lose everything. He gave it to him because God wanted him to have it. But he told Satan, you can take all of it away. God, notice he didn't say God would take it away. He said, you can take it away. But Job's still going to love me. Well, what happened here? I can't say that it happened, but there may have been a day that Satan went before God and said, you know, I've been walking up and down to and fro seeking whom he could devour. Right? Wandering the earth looking for somebody that he could point out to God that if you did this to that person, they'd start hating you. Well, he says, them three Hebrew boys, they haven't done anything and they've been promoted all the way up into Babylon. You threaten them with death and they'd renounce you. And God said, no, they wouldn't. He said, you can do whatever you want to with them. That may have been a device of the devil, but God said, you can try. It's not going to work. Well, why didn't it work? Because long before they ever got close to the fire, they had their firefighting clothes on. They's in the furnace every day, spiritually. They's in a pilgrim, they were pilgrims in a strange land. Technically, they were slaves. They weren't free to do what they wanted to do. They had to serve a king that overthrew the homeland that they loved. Then he sacked everything. Go read the book of Ezekiel and you go read the rest of the Old Testament. Right? You're going to find that when Babylon overthrew Jerusalem, they took all the things of God out and they put them in pagan temples and they put them in you know, idolatrous places as trophies of what they had accomplished. They got to walk around every day knowing, grieved in their soul, that they can't worship the way that God wants them to worship because they don't have a place called the house of God anymore. Now, they're in the furnace every day, but yet they still lived a life for God. So a real furnace wasn't no problem to them. But see, we tell ourselves, well, we made it through the last hot event in our life, but I don't want to go back into it. Why? In truth, what you know that either you're going to get better or you're going to become stronger as a result of the fire. Right? People don't like getting shots. They still go to the doctor. Why? Because they know shots make them better. So why are people such sissies when it comes to spirituality? Well, I can't see what's on the other side. It's hot. That's all you need to know. Get ready. Well, am I going to have to go into what, the, you know, the hottest? It's maybe seven times hotter than anything I've seen before. That may be true. But God's still God. His words will not fail you. He promised that if you became a king to rule and reign over your flesh, he made you a priest so that you could enter directly into the throne room of God. He promised that he'd never leave you nor forsake you. That's still just as true if the furnace is seven times hotter and, or there's seven times more smoke coming out of it. Right, but that, We're done on that one. Smoke does obscure things. Smoke also suffocates things. They say that if a person's in a fire, they don't die from the fire, they die from the smoke long before the fire ever gets to them. We've already said, it's not God's will for you to be in the smoke. You know what happens when you're in smoke? Your eyes get watery and you can't see. We've already said that, you, you know, you can't see what's on the other side of the smoke. Now you can't see it all. Now, you know what smoke really is? Smoke is everything that the fire couldn't consume. Nowadays, we don't see too much smoke when you, if you Google like a YouTube of furnace. Right? Nowadays, they use this thing called propane, right? If it's something in their backyard, like a fire pit. 
that they turn into a furnace because there's somebody like Jordan and they're like, I wonder what happened if we did this. And then they find out. Okay. But nowadays we use propane, natural gas, we use liquid fuel that gets just as hot, but you don't have to work a big set of bellows. You don't have to come in here, you know, instead of pumping a thing all day long to make sure that the fire stays hot, now you just set up a blower motor and, hey, we're good. Ron Popeil, set it and forget it, right? You just got to keep adding propane to it. Well, back then, right, that wood, that charcoal, anything else that they were throwing in this thing, if it could burn, it'd burn up. But some things, because they're either so small or because when you burn something up, some things aren't flammable. Right? They may melt, they may get smaller, but they don't burn up. Where do you think all that goes? That goes into the, the hot air from the fire, carries it up. Right? Just like a chimney. And then once it gets up there, where the temperature's a little bit cooler, all that hot air starts condensing into water vapor. So you've got essentially a cloud full of all the stuff that the fire didn't burn up. So when you walk into smoke, what are you breathing in? All the stuff that was too, too tough for fire to take care of. All the stuff that wasn't supposed to be a part of what was going into the fire. Right? Could be carbon. Could be a whole bunch of other stuff. Most of the time it's carbon. But you know why it... It's not a problem for it to go out with smoke because it wasn't supposed to be a part of whatever comes out of the furnace. Smoke is a whole bunch of stuff you can't do anything with. Not in truth. If it was something you needed, they'd be upset that it was going out with the smoke. But no, what they want is in the furnace. So if you're stuck out with the smoke, you know what you've got? You've got all the stuff that God doesn't have a use for. Because what God has a use for is in the furnace. The thing that God wants to use is in there being refined. It's being improved. The stuff that goes out the smokestack, that's all the stuff that's wood, hay, and stubble. It's going to burn up with a fervent heat one day. But all those gold, silver, and precious gems, where are they at? They're in the furnace. God's refining them to make them more precious, to separate those rocks from them, to get it to where there's no more of the world left in it. So in truth, the smoke, it'll, it'll kill you. Long before the flame ever will, if you stay out in the smoke. Well, it's too hot to go any further. Well, if you stay there, you're going to die spiritually. Man cannot serve two masters. They'll love one and hate the other. Jesus said that to come to him was life and peace. Well, what do you think that the other master, the carnal man, what do you think that he embraces? Death and captivity you know what these boys knew they could bow down and then they truly would have been a captive to Nebuchadnezzar to the world to the Babylonians or they could stand tall remain free in the grace where God had allowed them to be born into and to live in and they said but if we have to go into the fire at least we'll still be free guess where they would have been after that Abraham's bosom it was Old Testament economy. Well, what was that? It was paradise. They said, we'd rather be free. We'd rather go into the fire knowing God than stay out in the smoke and become a slave to the world, to sin, to self. The smoke is all the stuff that God doesn't have a use for. God doesn't want. God doesn't care if it disappears in the smoke. Keep in mind, in your Bible, both Old and New Testament, it does say that our God is a consuming fire. You know what he consumes? All the stuff he doesn't have use for. He chucks it to the side. Why do you think? I mean, just, just imagine one day. Moses told him, or he told Moses, no man could see him and live, Brother Randy. So imagine how much more a man could not live if he truly approached the presence of God. Nothing gets to God unless it's holy. You know what causes that to be true? That consuming fire. You can't get close to God unless all y'all are is holy. You stay in the smoke, you're getting all the stuff that God's done burned off, He's thrown it to the side, has no use for it. You're breathing in that all day long, of course you're going to suffocate. 
of course you're going to become anemic spiritually. Because all that you're consuming is stuff that, for lack of a better term, it's waste. There's no use for it. Take the ashes of a fire and make it into a piece of pottery. You can't. Because what's left in the bottom after you take out those things that you've refined, it's just more waste. It's waste that was too big to be carried away with the smoke. So if you're breathing in that all day long, if that's where you live because it's too hot, you understand that it's going to get hotter the closer you get to God because God's going to consume more things out of your life. But you also understand the more that you go into the fire, the closer you get to God. Was not the Son of God waiting for him in the fire? Nebuchadnezzar said he walked to the entrance and he saw, did we not throw three men in? I see a fourth. And his visage is as the Son of God. Right, they got closer to God than they'd ever been. But they had to get hotter than they'd ever been. Had to be thrown into a fire hotter than anything that these men had ever seen before. Anybody in the kingdom had ever known. But see the last thing and then we'll stop. Smoke's also a sign for help. It's distress. If you see smoke on the horizon, guess what? That means there's a fire. Y'all like to joke that you know I'm, I'm pretty smart. But even I know, okay, smoke means fire. Right? Everybody knows that. You don't have smoke without fire. Well, if you see fire in the direction of your house, you're going home to make sure that everything's not on fire. If you see smoke out in the middle of a forest, you know there's a forest fire coming this way. If you don't think that that's something to be taken serious, just look at you know every other year in California where half of everything gets burned up because of a forest fire. That's very serious. If you see smoke on the horizon and you know that somebody you know is in that direction, you know that they need help. Even if it hasn't gotten to where they're at yet, they need help in keeping the fire from getting to them. And I don't know why I remembered this yesterday, but at some point in my elementary school learning experience, they made me read a stupid book called Little House on the Prairie. And for some reason, yesterday, God, it, I could not tell you anything else about this book other than the fact that God reminded me of this section yesterday. I remember Claire's day, we were sitting in the classroom, teacher was going over a chapter, and there was a fire headed towards the homestead. You know what they did? That fire was burning up all of the grass. And they was on a prairie. Guess what's around them? Grass. They knew that if the fire kept coming their way, which it was, because that's the way that the wind was blowing, that fire was going to burn up their house. And by the time it got to them, it was going to be a big fire. So what they did was they started their own fire and fanned it towards the forest fire. Because fire can't be where there's nothing to burn. They started a little fire around their house and fanned it out towards the big fire so that by the time the big fire got there, it would just pass them by. Now see, there's a whole lot of things out in this world that are destructive. What's Satan's primary goal? He wants to destroy as many souls and take them to hell with him. He wants to consume every bit of the gospel, every bit of light, every bit of salt that there is in the world. He wants to hide every light underneath of a bushel. All for what purpose? To consume those that God offered redemption to. Well, how do you stop that? Well, first, you've got to go through the furnace, and you come out the other side on fire for God more than you've ever been. And there may be somebody who the devil has them in their sights. Maybe a lost person, maybe a saved person. But see, on the prairie, grass isn't what you're farming. What are you farming? You're farming wheat. Right, you're milking cows. All the important stuff's in the silo. Right, the stuff that if God gave it to you and it's in the silo, the devil can't touch it unless God says so. But see, the grass, what's that a picture of? That's just the world. The world trying to get to where you are and destroy what it is that God's given to you, what God's built for you. You know how to stop that? Start your own fire. Faint it back the other way. Smoke's a sign that something bad's about ready to happen. 
You see it on the horizon, what do you do? You may have to start, starking, start stoking your own fire and fanning it towards the smoke so that that doesn't get to where you are. You say, what's that mean, Brother Jordan? I don't know, maybe it means you've got to give up something that there may not be any sin in it. But if you do that, you also can't be right with God because you're not giving God all the time that He deserves in your life. Maybe it's instead of doing what I want to do today, I'm going to go and try and be good to somebody else. Right? Maybe you just drop an ember along your way that starts a little fire that protects them from the big fire that was on the way. Maybe someday somebody start trying to start a fire, you're just going to go over and work the bellows for them. Why? Because there's smoke on the horizon. Go read the book of Revelation when hell and earth and everything that God made is cast into the lake of fire. Read about the pillar of smoke that comes up out the ground then. Read about the smoke that comes out of hell when God opens it in the tribulation period and all those demons come crawling out of it. The smoke that they're going to have to face that smoke unless we do something about the smoke that's out there right now. The whole world's on fire. That's easy to see. But what are we going to do about it? We've still got a space of grace. Read all the prophecy. God promised that generation went past. What's that? Seven years. Israel has been a nation for over seven years now. Don't care if you use the Hebrew or whatever calendar we're stuck with nowadays. Right? We're just living on God's grace. Nothing else. There's a whole lot of smoke. A lot of people that need help. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.